aspects. All right, guys. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Dom, for inviting me. I am most happy to be here, and I want to especially thank everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Solomon SME. I am a software engineer. Uh, you can call me a full stack developer, but I am more focused on um, backend engineering. So today I will be walking us through the basics of web development because it is very important that as a technical uh, writer, you have a basic knowledge of what you want to write about. And if you are going to be writing about technologies, um, you need to have an idea of uh, technologies, especially uh, the web development aspects, which is uh, which is a very important. Um, so please let me know anywhere I drop off. I can always repeat. Okay, so I'm saying that um, today we are going to be looking at introduction to web web development, which is a very important skill for a technical writer. Um, because if you want to excel in that field, you need to understand technology because you definitely be writing about technology. So you need to have a basic knowledge um, of what web development is all about so that you know how to articulate your articles. Okay, so uh, I don't know if I'm sharing the right screen. As technical writers, I'm going to be speaking on the aspect of technical writers that are writing about technologies, right? So maybe in your previous classes, you might have learned that technical writers, technical writing is all about writing about a specific topic, and it could be anything. But please, let's just draw our attention down to um, writing about um, technologies and writing about um, development and software engineering. Okay, so if you are going to be in that space, or to be a technical writer that talks about um, you know, web development, software engineering, it is it is necessary or it is important that you have a basic knowledge of what you are going to be writing about so that you can be able to even start researching on the topic or the specific topic that is given to you. Okay, so here we are going to be introducing web development. And as Wisdom said, we are going to be talking about API, which is very important because um, that is even where documentation comes to play, where you have to document um, APIs and then you document the application, um, different APIs that... Um, that have been developed for a particular application. Okay, so web development involve or is a work that involves creating or developing a website uh, for the internet. So, like we all know, the internet is uh, you know kind of another world outside, outside of the real world. So, if you want to create pages, if you want to create web pages that are processed by the browser on the internet, it has to do with web development. Okay, so in as much as we have different areas. On a generic term, web development basically covers any web pages that is basically developed to run on the browser. Okay, so web development can range from developing a simple static web page to even a more complex web application. So we all use Facebook, for example. So we can categorize that as a very complex web application. Okay, so some of us also have developed. Some of us that are um, learning development, we have also developed a very simple, um, maybe information website. It is still web development, okay? So web development covers all that, and it covers these different ranges, no matter if it is simple or if it is complex, okay? So um, before you even start going into web development, the truth is that you need to understand the fundamentals, right? Before you start building these web pages, before you start creating things that the browser is going to help you interpret, you need to understand the foundations of web development. And that is basically what we are going to be doing today. So the first thing is understanding how internet works, right? So you can, you know, subscribe your phone as, you know, you have your NTN, you subscribe your data, and then you open Facebook and you start browsing, all right? We have the internet. Internet is basically um, some basic things that you need to understand before you even dive or before you dive into web development. So you need to understand how the internet works, all right? 
So um, you can call internet anything, but for me, it is basically um, a vast network that connects computers all over the world. So this computer is connected to this, inter this computer, and this computer is connected to this computer. And within these computers, there are web pages that basically have information. So we have like we have like a web page that can display an information that you are looking for. And while you are in your house, you basically browse, and there are some technologies that sh you know searches through this internet and brings out the web page that you want, which is you no know, search engines. So internet plays a very major role on web development and also plays a very major role on the overall um, internet um, ecosystem. So you need access to the internet, first of all, and then you need to understand how it works for you to be able to um, build web pages that are basically scalable, okay? Now, this is a place, or this is more like, I, can, I would say, a community where you share information. So you share this information in different formats. It could be uh, using text, it could be using video, it could be using um, audio, okay? So these different information are linked together so that it is easy to access. Uh, you use you can use hyperlinks to basically link up these documents together. Okay, so we have what is now called a website. So for you to build, uh, for you to be a web developer, you also need to understand what a website is because that is exactly what you are going to be building. All right. So a website is basically a collection of related pages. All right. So for you to have a complete website, you need to think, you know, what kind of pages does this website or do this website need? For example, you could say, if I want to create a website um, for my community, you could say, you could have about us page, you could have contact us page, you could have home page. So all these different pages, when they come together, right, they form what is called a website, okay? So yeah, so that's what a website is. But aside from these different terminologies, how does it really work, okay? So that is where we now have this diagram to show you what happens. Now, for you are a client, you that have your own phone, you have a browser, and then you have your internet, like your data or something. So you are a client, and then there is another computer somewhere, you know, hosted either on the cloud, maybe on the shared hosting platform. Now that computer holds the information or the um, documents that you are looking for. And these documents were basically created by you know, web developers. You can call them web developers, web designer, whatever you want to call them, right? So they were created by them. Uh, they took these whole pages that they have created and then hosted somewhere on the internet. And then you, as the clients, you are holding your phone and then you are looking for the information that they have created. So however you do it, you either search or you, you saw a link to where the information is located and then you click on that link. So what you did basically is that you have basically sent a request because you have the correct address to where that website or to where that document is situated. You basically send a request to the server that holds the information. And the server is going to check through your request to see maybe it is a secure request, it is a good request, or whatever it's going to do on the server. But at the end, it's going to return back a response to you. So the response will come in form of an error should telling you that maybe this request does not, does not exist or the page does not exist or whatever. Or most importantly, it will come as the information that you're looking for in form of a web page. So that is why when you, when you open Facebook, for example, you type facebook.com, you send a request, that is where you click on go. So you are sending a request and Facebook is going to return back a page to you. So that page basically contains some information. So most likely it's going to contain a form for you to log in, you know, and all of those other information. So that is how it works. It works by one person sitting in his house, also connected to the internet. The person sends a request because he knows where a particular resource is. If the person does not know where the resource is located, the person can do Google search, all right? So when the request goes to the server, you know, the server does all the processing and returns the right information that the person is looking for, you know. So these different um, requests and response happens almost like every day as long as you continue browsing, 
Okay, so it doesn't matter. You could return different types of information, right? You could return a video in the case of YouTube. You could return a text in the case of blogs. You could return um, images in the, in the case of maybe Instagram or maybe Pinterest. So they have different information that you could return, but you must know the request or the URL that you are sending that request to in, um, unless you have errors. So this gives you a general overview of how the internet works and how you know you send a request um, and receive pages on your web uh, on your browser. Now, what what makes this request to be possible, right? How do you how can you just take a you know a URL, type it on your web browser, and then click on go, and then the next thing you are getting a page. What really makes it possible? Okay, so we have something they call HTTP. So HTTP is basically called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Okay, so it is a short form for HTTP. Sorry, it's the um, longer form for HTTP. So it is basically a protocol or it is a rule. So that's what the protocol means. It is a rule that defines how you can send a request and the kind of response that is going to be returned to you. So these rules have already been defined, all right? So browsers just basically follows these rules, okay? So when you send a request, you know, the rule can return different pages to you. Most importantly, it's going to return a page that is in HTML format, okay? So this HTML format that is returned is what browsers are looking for, you know, to present properly to you. So browsers knows how to interpret HTML pages or HTML codes and make it look appealing to you, okay? So that is the job of a browser, basically parses HTML and then make it appealing to you, okay? So, but um, this HTTP helps you define a rule that goes to the server Remember, remember this diagram. So it, it finds a rule that helps you go to this server and searches for the page or the particular page that you are looking for. And then when it sees or when it gets the page, it returns it as HTML format. And then that format is now converted to, you know, nice designs in the case of Facebook. I like to use Facebook. So it's now converted to nice designs for you so that you can see how it is presented. Okay, so it is HTTP that defines that rules. Now, at the same time, HTTP also has a rules that can return different types of formats. So it could return images, it could return videos, it could return audio, it could also return um, text files, all right? So we have different, you know, format of files that could be returned. But most importantly, HTTP returns HTML for you so that it is... Um, it is it is displayed properly or nicely on the browsers. Now, um, another important thing is, in as much as you have HTTP, HTTP only one of the rule is that it only understand IP addresses. So IP addresses is internet protocol. Remember that HTTP is a protocol. So um, I said that the protocol is a rule, just like you know, different set of rules on how you can get access to something. Now, HTTP only understand what is called IP address, which I said it is internet protocol. So internet protocol is more like a set of numbers that is assigned to you. Just like you, are, you have a plot of land and that plot of land belongs to you alone. You can put in any, you can build a house, you can put in any property that you want, all right? So when you have access to a particular IP address on the server, now you can give this IP address to anybody and the, that person will be able to assess the information or the data or the documents that you have saved on the server that belongs to you. But as time goes on, um, you know, programmers of that time discover that it is more, it is more nice if this IP address could be letters instead of numbers because letters are easier to understand than numbers. So that is why they brought in something they call DNS, which is Domain Name Services, all right? So we are coming down to this one, Learn Domain Name Hosting, all right? So they brought out this Domain Name um, domain name Services. Now, this Domain Name Services basically maps a letter word 
to an IP address. All right, so that is the job. So if we have something like Facebook, which is a combination of letters. Now, Facebook is mapped to a particular IP address that belongs to Facebook, all right? So this IP address, uh, sorry, this um, letters or this domain name is basically assigned to an IP address. So when someone wants to access Facebook, the person does not or does not have to go through or the person does not have to use the numbers that is the IP address anymore. The person can easily just use Facebook, all right, which is mapped to the IP address. So that is why I, I, um, domain names are very important because at the moment, people do not use IP addresses to access web pages anymore. We all use domain names, which is um, kind of very easy to understand and also very easy to remember. So it is important as a technical writer that you have these basic knowledges and then know how these web pages entirely work so that you can be able to create um, your web page if you want to write an article that explains a certain thing on, on the web. So you know that you, you're not going to be a novice or you're not going to even know where to start um, your research. So having this basic knowledge would aid you in terms of doing your research to write that particular article. So we have different uh, providers that helps you create uh, domain names. We have uh, Google Host, which is popular in Nigeria. We have GoDaddy. We have Amazon Web Services and GCP. So you could look into these things and it could help you broaden your knowledge. Now, um, we also have an introduction to HTML. So remember when I was talking about um, HTTP, I said that HTTP basically returns HTML documents that is now formatted by the browser and shows you nice designs. Now, people or web developers are responsible for creating or understanding the HTML syntax, and then they use it to create the web page that the browser is going to interpret, okay? So introduction to HTML, you need to have that knowledge. You need to know the different syntax that belongs that you can create uh, with HTML. For example, we have basic HTML syntax. I'm just going to brush you guys through it because um, HTML is a little bit broad, combining it with CSS. So I'm just going to brush you guys through to give you basic understanding of it, and you can expand your, your knowledge from here. So HTML is hypertext markup language. So it is basically a language that is used to create um, web pages, okay? So if you want to create a web page, a web page, you need to use HTML. Just like if you want to create a um, document, you need to use what um, Microsoft Word and all of that. So if you need to create a web page, then you need to also you need to learn how to use HTML to do that. So it is basically a standard markup language for documents. Now these documents are only going to be displayed nicely on the browser. All right. So if you use Microsoft Word to create a document, Microsoft Word application will be able, uh, is the only app, and maybe now there are many other apps that are able to open Microsoft Word documents. So the same thing is applicable to HTML. If you create a, a document with, H, with HTML, sorry, uh, browsers are the only application, not really the only, but they are, they are only the most popular application that can interpret uh, HTML documents, okay? So guys, I want to know if, I, if we are following because of my network, let me not be talking to S. Please give me a following, we're following. Yeah. Yeah. I am actually very fast when I'm doing something like this. So please, you can help me, just slow me down. All right, I'm, I'm fast because I know there will be a lot of questions at the end. So please, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm too far, just slow me down. I'm going to come back to what I've said before, okay? All right. All right, thank you. Now, so HTML has syntax. Because it is a language, we need to follow the syntax to be able to create something that the browser is going to understand. So I have listed some of the you know, popular syntax or some of the popular tags that HTML has. So if you want to make your web page, the title of your web page very bold, for example, if you look at this document that I'm showing you now, you could see that this introduction to HTML is a bit bolder and a bit bigger, okay? So this is, or that is achieved using HTML, uh, HTML tag, 
um, H1 like this. Okay, so if you wrap H1, just like what we have here as an example, if you look at the syntax down, if you wrap H1, if you wrap, wrap um, your text in H1 tags like this, it's going to make the text to appear bigger. All right, so if you if you wrap it in H2, it's going to make the text to be bigger, but not as B1. <laughs> okay, so it's going to go like that down. If you wrap it in H3, it's going to make it bigger. It's going to make it a title, but the title is not going to be as bigger, as big as H1. And it's not also going to be as big as H2. Okay, so the progress goes down like that till we have H6. So, Anytime you need to use header, no matter how small the header is going to be, you should represent it or you should use H tags for such kind of thing. Okay? So if you want to represent a paragraph, like you want to type a long text, like what we have down here, I'm selecting it so that you know where I am. If you want to you know, create a paragraph like that, then you have to go with the paragraph tag. Okay, so if you look down, you have an example of how the paragraph tag is represented. So we have a greater than sign P and, and the less than sign covering it, and then we have the closing tag, um, something like this. Okay, so HTML has many tags for, for different things. Okay, so I have only given you an example of H1 or title tags which basically represent header tags, right? So we have tags for bold. We have tags for paragraphs, like I've mentioned. We have tags for italic, making your text slanty. We have different tags for different things. So you need to have an idea of this so that you don't get lost when you see an article that has these different tags, okay? So you need to learn them. It is easy to learn because it is just a document language. It is easy to learn. Okay, so just go, you know, browse some of the popular tags in HTML and get yourself acquainted with it. And then moving on, you will agree with me that if you build your house without, you know, painting the house or putting plastering and all of that fancy thing, the house is not going to be beautiful. All right. So the same thing is applicable to HTML documents. You can create a nice document with HTML, right? But it's not going to be beautiful. Let me use the word beautiful, right? It's not going to be beautiful because there is no styling. There is no color assigned to it. There is no um, you know, spacing that will be assigned to it. Now, that is where CSS comes into play. So CSS is basically a cascading style sheet. It is a language that helps you to style your HTML. Okay, so if you want to add colors to your HTML, if you want to add some kind of animations to your HTML, that is where CSS comes to play. So here I said um, CSS is a cas cascading style sheet, and it is a uh, style sheet language used for describing the presentation of a document. All right, so as HTML is a structural language, CSS is also a presentational language. What that simply means is that it helps you with display, it helps you with coloring, it helps you with styling, okay? So these are two things that you need to understand, all right? You need to have an idea of, but because this makes up web, um, the, at least the front-end part of web development, the part that the client sees, this is what makes it up. It is HTML and CSS that gives you the beauty that you see in any website, okay? So it is a good thing that you understand it. So the things that are important for you to learn in CSS, aside from the normal, the, the basic styling that you need to understand is selectors. So selectors enables you to select a particular, um, particular HTML tag that you want to style. So you could select the paragraph tag that I want to color all my paragraph tags red, or I want to color them you know, black, for example. Or you could select um, uh, an HTML tag based on the ID that you have assigned to that tag. So if you look at here, you see that what I'm doing here 
I am basically selecting all my paragraph tags in my document or in my HTML document, and then I am coloring it red. So everywhere that, my, um, that I have a paragraph tag is going to be colored red, okay? So if you look down here, I am also using uh, an ID tag to color a particular paragraph. So in this case, I want to select a particular paragraph and I want to color that, par that paragraph red, okay? So I have to assign an ID to that paragraph that I want to color red. And then in my CSS file, I then select it by using the hash symbol. So once you use this hash symbol in CSS, you are simply referencing um, a paragraph or an ID, an ID that you have assigned to a particular tag. And once you color it red, it simply means that only the, the element that has that ID that is going to be affected. Okay, so we have other um, selector, which is called the class selector, okay? So the class selector is, you basically assign a class ID or a class um, name to a particular element. It could be anyone, it could be any HTML element. It could be paragraph, it could be header, it could be anyone that you're going to learn in the future. So once you assign a class um, to it, you give it a name, and then you can assess it in your CS test um, using the dot sign like this. So you use the uh, full stop sign, the name of the, uh, the class, and then you assign your color to it. Now, these selectors that I've mentioned here are just the basic selectors that you need to know. There are advanced way of selecting elements. And it is important that you at least get to a point where you understand these um, different selectors. So I also left um, a link to where you can see the other different types of selectors that I did not cover in this uh, particular article, okay? So if you have an idea of HTML and CSS to maybe a basic, um, a basic knowledge of it, you will be able to create a simple web page. Remember I said, however you do, whether it is a simple web page or a complex web page, it is basically web development. So with this the knowledge of HTML and CSS, you could create a simple web page that has no actions, okay? So the web page is just going to be dormant. It could be just to display an information like this. So something like this that we have, we used to display this information that we are reading at the moment, does not need any action because just basically display an information to me. It, it is not collecting my, my information. There is no need to submit any form on this page. So this kind of page could be created using just HTML and CSS. But if you need to add actions to your web page, that is where you need to learn a Turing complete programming language. So the one that is most closer to front end is JavaScript. It is very necessary or important that you learn JavaScript as uh, someone that wants to do web development, okay? So Java, uh, JavaScript is a programming language itself. The reason why it is a programming language is because it is Turing complete. So it has control flow structure. It has iterative flow structure. You know, all these different, it has sequential flow structure. All these things makes up a Turing complete language, okay? So um, that is JavaScript, and it is very necessary because we use JavaScript to add actions to our web page. For example, if you want to submit a form, and then you want to make sure that that form that you are submitting is that you are submitting is properly checked against different parameters, so that they, people will not submit what you don't want them to submit. So if you want to do such validations, you need to make use of JavaScript. And there are other things that you could do with JavaScript, but this is just a basic one. So for example, if we want to select um, this paragraph that we have created here, and then we want to change the color to green. Remember that CSS in this CSS example, we added red to it. So we want to use JavaScript to change the color to green. So what we are going to do is to select, is to select it using um, the different selectors that we have listed. So for example, we could select it by ID. So remember that we have already assigned an ID to it up here. So we could select this particular paragraph by the ID that we have assigned. So in JavaScript, this is how you do it. Now, the reason why you do it this way is simple. This document represents 
that's your HTML documents that you have created, that one that the browser knows how to interpret. So everything that is on the document can be accessed or is also available as a global object in JavaScript called document. So once you select this document, you can have access to every element in your web page. And depending on how you want to select them, you can select them using ID, which is what I have done in this example. You can also select them using um, class like this. So you can say, um, get element by, by class. And there are different other ways you can select the element on your document, okay? So once you select it, then you have access to this full um, paragraph tag here, okay? So you can change the color by calling style. So style is basically a way to style your element in line, or you can style it inside uh, HTML without writing any um, CSS. Okay, so once you call the style, you have access to the color property of the style, and then you can assign green to it. So basically, that is going to change this color from red, that we use CSS to style, to green, that we now use um, JavaScript to style. Now, this is a very brief introduction, just to tell you how important JavaScript is, because it, it, it gives you uh, abilities to add actions to your, to your browser or to your document. It also gives you the ability to add functionalities to your document. So it is like a gown of three. You need to understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it is important that you understand them in this order, and also you understand them, uh, you understand these three things before you can move forward to um, learning other aspects of web development. Now, moving on, since we have basic idea of um, JavaScript, now we could create an entire web page or an entire website, you know, collection of different web pages using these three things that we have listed. But it's going to be a very difficult task for us to do. The reason is because you're going to write longer code and you might not really know how to structure them properly. So that is why we have, or they have introduced something they call front-end frameworks. So front-end framework helps you take away some boilerplate codes that you will have been, uh, that uh, you would have been written yourself. You know, some things like structuring of your web page, you know, um, some client-side validation codes have already been done for you. You know, different things have already been done for you so that you only focus on the business logic that you're trying to implement. So that is why frameworks is, is important, even as a front-end web developer. So we have top three different frameworks that you can choose to learn, or you can decide to learn all since you are a writer. So you have different opinions to talk about when you are um, writing about front-end frameworks. So we have React, we have Vue, we have Angular. So these are different frameworks that have already given you access to, um, to boilerplate codes or they have already helped you to write different um, logic that you would have done by yourself, or they have already helped you structure um, your web pages in a way that, that you need, that um, is universally accepted or that, has, that is best practice, okay? So as a technical writer, it's important that you go deeper into these frameworks. You understand. You understand them so that when... You, are, you want to write an article around it, or when you want, you want to edit articles around it, you know what you're doing. Or when you are reading up for research, and then you see something that has to do with these different frameworks, you are not completely lost. Okay? So that is that for... Okay, I think uh, an aspect of web uh, development. Now, it is also important as technical writers that you understand RESTful APIs and how to document them, okay? So REST plus API basically stands for representational states transfer, okay? So what that simply means is that it is, it is a set of rules or it is a, you know, kind of a design pattern on how you should write your, your APIs, okay? So it gives you a basic rules on the way that you need to write your APIs, okay? So um, the REST determines the structure, like I said. So if you have an API to write, how are you going to structure it? That is what, that is the standard that REST API basically um, um, 
tries to portray. So it gives you a way to determine the structure of your API. You know, something like specific rules. If you need to accept information, if you need to accept information from um, users, what kind of protocol are you going to use? What kind of uh, uh, method all this for you to know the different rules that you need? It's more like creating a standard for it. Okay, so um, we when we combine the API, the API that we want to create with the REST design rules, we could say that we have basically created a RESTful API. Okay, so we have an API to create in our mind um, a set of rules that is defined by the REST. Uh, RESTful API. So when we successfully do that, that simply means that we have created a RESTful API. Okay. So I know my screen has basically stopped. Um, I'm trying to so share that. Okay. So um, once once we have done that, now what are this, what are these rules that are set out for people to follow when creating APIs. Okay. Now you need to make sure that the client side architecture is managed as a protocol or another kind of rule that is used to send and receive requests or information. So RESTful API is telling you that for you to align or for you to follow um, the standard that is laid out for anyone that tries to use RESTful API, your architecture or your system needs to follow or needs to be managed by HTTP. So we have different protocols. I didn't mention that earlier. So we have HTTP as one. We have UDP. We have FTP. Sorry, all these the acronyms. Okay, FTP means file transfer protocol. UDP means, um, I think, uh, unified, whatever, Transfer protocol. Sorry, I, I, I'm not sure of that. But HTTP is not the only transfer rule. So we have those other two. But they are trying to let you know if you want to create a REST API, you need to make sure that your architecture uses HTTP. Okay. Then the next set of things or criteria is that the cache data that simplifies the exchange of data between clients and server. So you need to cache those data so that you do not always hit your database when, um, when you want to assess uh, the same data always, okay? So you need to make sure that the data are cached or, or properly cached and follow a set of rules when it comes to caching um, your data, okay? So this is one, uh, one criteria that you need to put in place when you are dealing with RESTful APIs. Now, another thing is clients, should be able to use hyperlinks to assess all the other actions they may take. So if I'm, I'm currently here now, so a client, which is the browser that is trying to assess the information on the server, should basically, yeah, should basically only be using or should be able to use hyperlinks. So I told you about hyperlinks earlier, I said hyperlinks are basically those links that connect pages together. So if you have home page in your web browser and then you have about us page and then you have contact page, you know, those links, those anchor tags that connect these different pages together are basically called hyperlinks. Okay. So RESTful API rule, one of them is telling you that for you to um, for you to make use of our rule, one of the criteria is that. Client, which is the browser that is trying to access information on, on the server, should be able to do that using hyperlinks. Okay. Now the next rule here says that client-side communication should be stateless. Okay. So that what that simply means is that if you are sending a request to um, the user, sorry, sorry, if you are sending a request to the server, now the request should not have um, or the, the clients and the server should not know the communication that they are talking about. Okay, it should be stateless. It should basically not um, have any stateful property 
between the client and the, and the server. What that simply means is that the information that a client basically sends um, to uh, the server uh, should be kept between get requests. Okay, so what that simply means is that remember that for you to access information on the server, you need to send different requests. So if you are going to send two requests, the, the information that you send on the first request should not be known to the, to the second request, or the second request should not also share the same information, or the information on the second request should not be known to um, the first request that you send. So you should, you should always send separate um, requests and all related requests. So that is the reason why you are able to use something like get to get information, you are able to use something like post to you know, send information to the server and update, uh, which is put to basically update an, an information on the server. Okay, so the messages, the next one here says client messages should have needed for the server to process that information. Okay, so that is basically uh, the next uh, criteria that is needed for you to make for you to be using the RESTful APIs. So we have the last one here that says uh, a multi tiered system that uh, organizes servers of each type. Okay, so this particular uh, system should be responsible for the security. It should also be responsible for the load balancing, which is basically talking about scaling. Okay, so for you to uh, be using RESTful API, one server should be responsible for load balancing, should be responsible for security and all that uh, different pieces that makes up uh, a server. So it should be resp responsible for that and not share these different um, loads. So you could basically um, scale your system by either putting in more resources on a particular, on your server to increase um, um, the scalability of that particular system. But when you're sending a request, you should send your request to a specific server at a specific time to retrieve um, the information. Okay, so these are some of the criteria. Um, REST, if you go to the RESTful API website, you see a lot of the criteria that you need to follow to create, um, um, should I say, a better RESTful API or to make sure that you're following the RESTful API pattern. Now we have some design patterns or the, some practices that can help you um, when you're building your RESTful APIs. Okay, so I'm here again trying to share the screen. This thing has always logged me out, <laughs> and I will always try to log back in and share the screen again. So it's crazy here. So here we have some design patterns or some kind of best practices when you are making use of the RESTful API. So we have your RESTful API must accept and respond with JSON. Okay. So that is the reason why if you are looking through anybody's API, you, you always know that, you always see that, you know, the response always comes in form of JSON data. So the JSON data is now used by front-end engineers to present or to display the information. Now, that does not mean that there are no, res there, there are no other response formats, okay? So as a technical writer, you need to go deeper into understanding these other formats. So we have um, XML, that is XML, and then we have JSON. But then JSON is particularly used by RESTful APIs to respond um, data. And then the next best practice is that um, use nouns instead of verbs in your endpoints. So what that simply means is that when you want to create an endpoint for something like posts, for example, a user is supposed to be able to retrieve all the posts that they have made on your website, and then a user is also supposed to create a new post on your website. So when you're creating an endpoint for that, you don't need to use um, create post, you know, um, get post. You don't need to use that as the name of your endpoint. So you can go ahead to use something like post, you can go ahead to use something like, um, sorry, post, and then in the different methods, like get, like post, and then you separate how the user or how the server responds to this different request. So that's the reason why they said, don't use verb, don't use things like create post, which is like a verb, use things like noun, something like post, which is a noun, and then you also have something like user, which is, which is, more, which is a noun. 
Okay, so the next one is make sure that you are using the correct status codes when you are handling error. So um, most of the time when we send requests, um, the server could not process those requests. The server needs to respond back to the client with errors. So make sure that you're always sending the right error messages. Sorry, you're always sending the right error messages and- at Live time, streaming has stopped. The right um, status quo. Okay, so we have a lot of the best practices. Um, I have listed them here. So Wisdom is going to maybe share this with you guys so that you go and read it and you know have more overview on it. So yeah, so we can design API docs. Once you have mastered APIs, you know, you can basically create a basic API for yourself. Now, how do you document this API? How do you create information that other developers are going to read and understand your API? So that is where API documentation comes to play. So you could use different tools. For example, Postman is very popular. You can also use Somania to create um, your different API documentation. You can basically create an API doc that is for internal use, and it is for intended for developers also. So basically what you do with that is that you basically describe a particular endpoint. So endpoint is like a URL that users can use to retrieve information or send information to your server. So that is what a, an, an endpoint is. So you basically write a detailed information about what that particular endpoint is doing. And at the same time, you also tell the person that is going to be using that endpoint how they should use that endpoint. So if that endpoint re require a get method or even requires a post method, okay? So you also specify that. And at the same time, you also show the user the different type of, or more like example of how the request should look like. Okay, so the different data that is needed, you know, the ones that are optional and the ones that are required. So Postman allows you to do all this. So I'm just telling you what are needed. So at the same time, while you show the user is a sample of how the request should look like, you should also show the user a sample of how the response should look like. So if the user sends this particular correct request based on your sample, now, this is going to be the response. This is how the response is going to be structured. So remember that RESTful API responses should always come in form of JSON. So you should also show the JSON structure of the information, all the information that is going to be retrieved. Even if the information is optional and needed, it should also be shown so that the user or the person that is going to be using that API or that endpoint fully understand what is expected of him and what is expected uh, from the server. So that is how you structure your API endpoints. And you do this thing um, on all the endpoints or all the URLs that you have created for the developer, OK? So the next thing I wanted to talk about is open API spec. So open API spec is basically define a standard of how you can create RESTful APIs, okay? So um, RESTful API has criteria that makes it RESTful APIs, but Open API Specs gives you standard, more like a uh, uh, universal way of how you can structure your API that makes sense for documentation, okay? You don't make it easy for developers or for documentation writers to be able to document that API that they have created. Okay, so if a developer or if a documentation writer follows open API spec, the person is going to be able to document an API. And at the same time, if the person is a developer, the person is going to be able to create an API that is documentable. Okay, so an API that you can document or an API that is easy to document if you follow uh, this open API spec. So I have the website uh, where you can read more about the spec. It is basically swagger.io slash specification. So swagger.io also helps you to create um, API documentation. I think they, they are more into automating, automating the process. So I think you just have bring in your APIs and then you generate um, 
um, those documentation for you. Okay. So yeah, that is what I have today. And sorry for my internet. I really, really, really apologize for that. It is uh, a general thing for me in this area. So I apologize. Okay, so I'm open to questions. Zini wanted to say something, so I'm open to questions. I'm open to feedback. So wisdom, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Solomon, for your time, and thank you for this great lecture. I know a lot of us have learned one or two from this. So guys, so do we have any question? So this is Q&A section now. Okay, so then it says it was a mistake. All right, that's fine. So guys, any other questions? 